It's Wednesday night, and I'm talking to you about several subjects together. Something has really bothered me lately about what men say about predestination. I'm not even talking about people who don't believe in it. I'm talking some about that. But even the men who claim to believe in predestination have a hitch in it. They, they're holding back on some things. I'll tell you why I believe they are. I was reading, I, for some reason, I picked up my Matthew Henry commentary. I wanted to see what he said about predestination. He called himself a reformer. Reformer. Well, hold on a second. There were a lot of reformers. And the reformers, they came out of either Catholicism or out of the Church of England. Of course, the Church of England came out of the Catholic Church, and they had the Eucharist in their, in their mass, just like the Catholics did. And the reformers came out of that, and most of the reformers, uh, like Luther, Zwingli, uh, Z-W-I-N-G-L-I, Zwingli, and many of the other reformers came out and preached predestination. That's what was one of their main subjects. And the reason they called themselves reformers because they wanted to reform the Church of England or the Roman Catholic Church. I'm not a reformer because I do not believe the Roman Catholic Church or the Church of England can reform because they would, it wasn't founded on the truth anyway. So the people that call them reformers in America, you got Reformed Baptist, Reformed Baptist, and you got Reformed Presbyterians, Presbyterians, and they are supposed to believe predestination. But I believe what most of these people believe as reformers, they believe predestination light. It's kind of like Bud Light. Don't make you too drunk. It's just not heavy duty, hard hitting. Uh, most of them like the Calvinist. Now you don't name something after a man till after he is dead. So the Calvinist, John Calvin was not a Calvinist. He was John Calvin. He was a Roman Catholic priest. These are his commentaries up here. They're all them right there. And uh, Calvinists believe in a form of predestination. They think they believe it, but they don't believe what I believe. They believe babies go to hell. Now, I did a 16-tape series, Why Babies Cannot Possibly Go to Hell. First of all, they can't sin. Wages of sin is death. Babies have a sin nature, and if they get to sin, God, if they are elect, while they're in sin, God protects them, hems them in. That's what Galatians, the third chapter says, until faith comes in their life. Well, people ask me if I'm a Calvinist. I believe in more predestination than any Calvinist I have ever met. I believe in more predestination than any reformer I've ever known. Uh, I believe God creates evil. He wants it to happen. What amazes me, uh, I don't know if people realize this, who created sin? Who set up the law? I think it was God, wasn't it? Look back over here in Genesis, the second chapter. It's Genesis, the second chapter. And read with me there. In Genesis 2, verse uh, 8 and 9. 
And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. There he put man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God is the one that planted the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and says, Thou shalt not. If he says, Thou shalt not eat of that tree, is that not God's law? And it's God that planted the tree why did he even put a tree of a knowledge of good and evil there? He had, a plan. he had a program. He had a plan. Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Adam had to sin. I'll say it, try to make it quick. Adam was made out of corruption. God did not tell Adam, if you eat of the tree... He didn't say, if you eat. He said, the day you eat, you will die. The day you eat. And I don't believe people go back to this far enough. Adam was made out of corruption. I've brought this out so many times in Genesis 1.1. -1. Genesis 1.1 -1 says, in the beginning... God created, created heaven, the heavens, and the earth. So the creation is there in the first verse. Create is the word bara. It means to cut, make fat, Fat to the Jew was not cellulite, uh, this fat on my side. That's not fat to them. Fat was the richest, the richest of the crops, the richest, the most healthy of the cattle. Bara is a righteous word because it comes from the word bareth, I-Y-T-H, which is the word covenant. So the covenant of God starts off in the first verse of Genesis. Now some people call this the gap theory. I believe six days of creation is not even a good, it's not even a theory. It's a corruption. There's no such thing as six days of creation. That's ridiculous. The creation is in the first verse. And then Genesis 1, 2 says, The earth became without form, form, and void, and darkness was on the surface of the deep. The word is face. Panim is the word. P-A-N-I-Y-M. It means face. So here's the earth. And there was some kind of cloud around the earth blocking the light that was created in the first verse from getting in. And then without form, I've said this so many times, is the word tohu. It means worthless. Well, the covenant of God in the first verse doesn't have anything to do with worthless. You have to look at that 12th chapter of Revelation. This is what you call, 12, a panoramic view of all time. Panoramic. When you think of panoramic, you remember the old movies back in the 50s and 60s? They said uh, panoramic and 
so and so sound. They say it was a panoramic movie. That meant it would cover the, all the wide screen. It comes from the word Pan. Pan was the god of all in the ancient world. He was said to be the, the god of all things. Well, when you pan an audience, you sweep the audience and take a view of all of them. So, this Revelation 12 is a picture of all time. It shows the woman with 12 stars, and that is a picture of Israel or the church. And it shows Michael the archangel laying hold of Satan and throwing Satan and a third of the angels out of heaven. And they're not demons. I don't have time to go on that. A third of the angels out of heaven. Well, the angels are locked in, in hell or in Tartarus, according to Second Peter. And then Second Peter, the second chapter. And Satan is the prince in the power of the air that roams through the earth. Now, I can't explain him fully. I don't believe anybody can. But you've got a panoramic view, and you've got Michael the archangel throwing Satan in the earth. Well, you have to go back here. Where do you find Satan was cast into the earth? You look for the first place you find his character in the Bible. And the first place of his character is Genesis 1-2. The earth became without form and void and darkness. There's his character right here. There's no character of Satan when God cuts and makes fat and gives his covenant to the earth. The Bible says the stars are not clean in his sight. The moon is not clean. That's in Job. The moon is not clean. The stars are not clean. And what is man that he should be clean? The Bible says God doesn't put any trust in his saints in that 15th chapter of Job. You know what he's saying there? He's not going to trust saints in the New Testament Greek is the same word as holy. He's not going to trust you to make a decision for him because you have no good in you. God picked up Adam of the dust, of this corrupt dust, and formed Adam of the dust of the ground. Formed is the word yatsar. Yatsar is the basic same word as potter. Now, when you put clay on a potter's wheel, you're not creating. You're making and forming. You pump that wheel, you put a little water on it, you pound it down, you shape it with your hands as it spins around on the potter's wheel. You're making and forming. The six days were not six days of creation. The creation is in the first verse. David said, God creates with his breath. So when you've got God creating with his breath, that's when he picked Adam up and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And besides all this, Isaiah 45. Now I have to sell this to tell you why Adam had to sin. Isaiah 45 and 18, God says, Everything that I created... I created it to be inhabited. I created not in vain. Well, this is the same word in Isaiah 45, Barah. He says, I did not create in the first verse of Genesis, Tohu, without form, without form, without form. I did not create that in the first verse. So when you get into the you get into the first day, when God says, Let there be light, the best scientist will tell us that we have at one time the earth was covered with some kind of cloud around it. And in the first day is not even here yet. In that third verse, God says, Let there 
be light. That's not when he created light. He created light in the first verse. What he's saying is let the light in. That's a picture of predestination when he says darkness is on the surface of the deep. And God says, let my light in. That's what he says about his predestinated elect family. The first verse of Genesis. Then he goes into six days of making and forming, not creation. He did create man on the sixth day, but that was with his breath after he'd formed him from the dust of the ground. So the fact that Adam was made out of this corruption... And God says, I didn't create anything in the first verse. I didn't create it in vain. The fact that, that you've got without form, and it's that corrupt dust that God picked up Adam and formed him and made him into a being, then he created life in him, whoo, breathed into him the breath of life. Now, when Adam comes to the tree... God doesn't say, if you eat, that's like saying to a baby, if you sin, when you get older, I'm going to whip you. You don't say, if you say, if you sin. You say, when you sin, and you're going to sin, I'm going to spank you, don't you? You don't say, if you sin, because they're going to sin. All of us are going to sin. Adam had to sin. That didn't make him a sinner. That didn't make him corrupt. His flesh was corrupt over here. So, God, that's God that set all this in action. So, Adam couldn't do nothing but sin. It was God's will that he sinned. Being God's will, God ever, he, like Mary said earlier, he had a program. He was the lamb slain for Adam's lineage, those that he had chosen out of the human race before the foundation of the world. He had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, but he didn't just choose us to be in heaven. He chose us to be holy and without blame before him in love. That's what predestination is about. There's some things that have bothered me I was reading Matthew Henry, and he, Matthew Henry said the same thing that uh, the pulpit commentary, I've got a set of those, got a lot of information in it, but they got a lot of things I don't believe. Pulpit commentary, that's like 23 volumes, 23 and I went into Romans 9. They said the same thing that Matthew Henry said. And Matthew Henry's got a, it's a set of commentaries. And then they said the same thing that Hendrickson said. And this is what most people say that claim to believe in predestination. They say God looked ahead in time and saw who would who would believe him. And who would not. God's grace is not dependent on anything that you will do. In fact, it's completely independent of what you will do. The main reason, the main reason he didn't look ahead is because he looked ahead to see what he had done, what he was doing. He does, God doesn't do anything by guesswork. He knows everything that's going to happen because he's ordained everything that's going to happen. He said so over and over and over again. He tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, 
5.18, in everything give thanks. That means every bad thing give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Will of God. I can't write while I'm talking. This is the will of God. Everything that happens to you, sickness, break a leg, lose a job, get a divorce, is God in that too? I keep saying, if God is going to have wrath on some, you can't have wrath without mercy. And you can't have mercy without wrath. If you didn't have any wrath intentionally by God, what do you call mercy? It would have no definition. You just have to call it, oh. It wouldn't have any. If everything was sweet in the world, it was all sugar and and all you, all they had was sugar cane and grain sugar, but it had no salt and nothing sour, no lemons, no limes, and that, there was no sour in the world. Sugar wouldn't have a definition. You couldn't call it sweet, because sweet is in opposition to something that's not sweet, isn't it? So, God had to make all this. He made the wicked for the day of evil. Now, most of these guys say, well, God's predestined us to be in heaven one day. In heaven one day. And he's, this is what a lot of the reformers will say. I've heard them say it. There's supposed to be predestination, and they say, he left everyone to themselves. No, he did not. I don't know how in the world they can say that when the Bible says, Proverbs 16 and 4, 16 and 4, the Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked, for the day of evil. He made the wicked for the day of evil. And the Bible says in 2 Peter, 2 and 12. Speaking of these presumptuous men, clouds without water, wells without water, clouds that are driven about with the tempest, they cannot cease from adultery. The Bible says that these people were made to be taken and destroyed. They're only made for one reason, to be destroyed. But the astounding thing about that, it's not the word made, it's the word genea. It means born. They were born for hell. That's why they were conceived by their parents, so God could put them in hell. Now, most predestinations don't believe that. I believe it because the Bible says so that they, there's no chances. You don't have a chance to be saved. You're saved by the will of God, not your will. Men are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God, John 1, 13. It's God's will that a man goes to heaven. It is not his own will. Now, and there's another verse. I can't get all of this out in one lesson. Romans 9, 22. Romans 9, 22 says, God willing. Now, this, this shows you how one word can really change the meaning of something. God willing... It says in the English Bible, God willing, it says if, but it doesn't say if in the text. 
God willing to show his wrath. This is why you got to understand gender. This word wrath, God willing to show his wrath and make his power known. Make power known. God willing to show, it doesn't say God willing to show his wrath. Not in the original text it doesn't. It says God willing to show te or G Ada. The orge, this is feminine gender. It cannot be possibly be his or God's wrath. His is a masculine gender possessive pronoun. God is not, he is not a female. And it, they took his, they took the feminine gender and turned it into his. You can't do that. But they did, the translators did. And orge is the wrath and anger and fury. The ada on the end of that is feminine gender. The orge of man, God wanted to show it so he could make his power known. He wants man to get out there and do all his evil so he can overthrow them and show who he is. And boy, the, most of the predestinationists don't like that. But this orge, the Bible says in Romans, the first chapter, that that was placed upon men. You know how it was placed upon us? God formed us of the dust of the ground and it's in this flesh to fulfill self and to be angry and have this orge. So the Bible says God willing to show the wrath of the people. He wants to show the fury and the rage of man so he could cast him down and destroy him. It doesn't say the wrath in every... I'll, I'll bet you, and I'm not supposed to bet, <laughs> I'll bet you that most, most reformers, and they all quote this, but I'll, I dare say not hardly any of them know that it's not his wrath, it's te, that's a form of the, feminine gender, or gay feminine gender. I don't care what anybody says. Mr. Mount said in one of his books, or oh, gay could be God's wrath too. Mr. Mouse is a brilliant scholar, but I don't agree with him on that at all. I believe God is exact in his word in the original text. So he was willing to show the wrath of people because they were made to be taken and destroyed, and they're wicked for the day of evil. There's a verse there, and the first verse of of Proverbs 16. Look at it real quick. It bothers me that reformers don't really fully believe in the sovereignty of God. They believe God sovereignly picks out his people to go to heaven, but they think he just leaves the rest of them alone when the Bible says they were made to, they were born to be taken and destroyed. Born, that word made, is a form of genesis. Genesis is our word genesis and it means birth. Their birth was so God could send them to hell on purpose. You know why people won't get really down to it on this? I believe this. I believe the reformers are trying to justify God and keep him from sinning. So they say, God wouldn't make, make evil. He wouldn't make sin. Well, who made it if he didn't? When he made Satan, did he put a glitch in him? Yes. The two other big angels in heaven, Michael and Gabriel, they're going to be with us in eternity. They're God's godly, righteous messengers. 
Why didn't he make Satan that way? He could have, but he had a program. People don't like the idea. <coughs> they want to reason God out according to their 20th, 21st century reasoning. That's what they want to do. If we can ever come to the point of actually believing as believers that everything in our lives is the will of God, do you know we'll really settle down? You'll start resting and relaxing. When something happens, you say, look at that. That, guy, that train ran over my car. I, um, I guess that's what God wanted. You, know, you go on your way and do something else. When you come to that point, I've been coming to that point in, since I passed 70. I'm 80 now. What am I going to worry about and for what? So in the next 10 years before I die, I can stress out, maybe have another heart attack. Everything that's going on is the will of God. He works all things after the counts of his own will. That's what he says. We've obtained inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of God who works everything in your life. I don't care if it's a ticket, if it's some guy smarting off to you. You're not supposed to smart off to them. Walk away from them. That's, that is the answer that conquers all of our problems. If we can get that through our heads, we have a hard time doing that, don't we? <laughs> I know that. But if you'll fight until you're old, you'll wake up one day and you'll say, this is not working. I think I'll try something else and quit fighting. I used to fight, phys not physically, but verbally fight people. Do you know how much it changed? Nothing. Didn't change anything. Besides that, God's working in their life to be a pill in your life. If something's happening to you, they're doing that so you'll go through what you're going through so you'll learn to quit. Maybe he'll teach them to quit down the road somewhere if they're believers. Now, what bothers me, uh, you know, we go by, go to the store, buy half and half. Half and half is what most of the reformers believe. Half predestination and half free will. I believe everything is of God. I keep saying this. David saw Bathsheba on the housetop. He didn't have any clothes on. She was bathing out there. He said, I want her. He got her, got her pregnant, had Uriah the Hittite, her husband, put in the heat of battle, had his nephew, Joab, who was his commander-in-chief, back away from Uriah so that Uriah be killed so he could have his wife. And then the baby she's going to have, she's pregnant, the baby dies, and later on, from Bathsheba and David is born Solomon. And God had planned for Solomon to build the temple, but all of that was planned before the foundation of the world. But the, the plans wouldn't have been there without David having the, incest, the lustful affair with Bathsheba and without murdering her husband, Uriah the Hittite, Solomon would have never been born. It, now, I, I don't try to get a hold of that. I just believe that. Now, so God wants evil to happen. You know why he wants it to happen? Because he wants to have wrath on these vessels of wrath fitted to destruction in order to show his mercy on the vessels of glory, which the vessels of mercy which he had to fore prepared to glory. He wants this to happen in order to have mercy on us. Now, let me take you back over to the verse that so many people argue about. Go back to Romans 8, 29. 
there's a word in Romans 8, 29 that's more important than any other word concerning these reformers and these Presbyterian, the PCA of America, Presbyterian Church of America. Look over here in Romans 8, 29. There's a word in here that is so, so important that we can't emphasize enough. For whom? Whom is the word I want to talk about? You've heard me say this before. God did not say, for what he foreknew. He said, for whom he did foreknow. Whose? This does not say, like I've been told by people, even like some of these commentaries will say, doesn't say God looked ahead and saw who would accept him. Because no one would accept Christ because Romans 3 and 10 says, there is, as it is written, it's written in Psalms 14, 1 through 3, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That's not talking about babies. That's talking between Jew and Gentile. That's the context of chapter 3. Between Jew and Gentile, nobody is righteous. So if you have no righteousness in you, when you are dead, how are you going to come alive? Every time you find the word quicken, Quicken, Z-O-O-P-O-I-E-O. -O -O -E -O. And you have, he quickened, speaking of God. He quickened, zoon, comes from zoon. We get our word zoo from that. That's where they have living animals. And poeo, meaning to make. Who does the making alive? Do you do that with a decision when you are dead in sin? You don't have any righteousness. If you read on in this verse, you can see that. There is none righteous. There is none that understandeth. There is none. Nobody who has ever lived seeks God, period. None seeks God. They are all going out of the way. They are altogether become unprofitable there is none that doeth good no not one if nobody seeks god how can and they'll try to come up and say well you have to cooperate with the holy spirit you're dead you can't cooperate with anybody you're dead in sin it's like going down and to a funeral home and you have a dead loved one, you walk up to the cat say, if you will try, I'll try, and we can maybe get you to come back to life. They're dead. They can't come alive. They have no will to do anything. You don't have any will. You don't seek God. Nobody has the will. It is, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that shows mercy on a person and cuts into their heart. Everybody you run into during life, every human being is either a vessel of wrath or a vessel of mercy. And that's already been determined from the foundation of the world. If we can get that in our heads, we won't argue with anybody. I'd spend less time probably than anybody here talking to somebody about truth if they just flat don't want us. Excuse me, walk away. I, I might as well be talking to a rock or talking to a tree out in my yard. I can't go out there and get a tree. Why don't you become a rock? You can't talk goats into being sheep. Now, the Bible says, for whom he did not foreknow. He did not say, for whom God foreknew would accept him. For God knew, uh, for God foreknew he foreknew whom, for whom he did prognosco.
if you know a whom, it's a people you know, isn't it? It's not events. Even though God knew all the events, he's declared the end from the beginning. In ancient times, everything that's not yet done, he knows everything because he's ordained all things. The Bible says he's declared the end from the beginning. He's declared the end of all things from the beginning. And wherever you are in time, everything that's not yet done, he says everything that happens in your life. How do you like that? When you have a problem and you have a sick problem, or you can't make your car payment, or they're going to foreclose on something, God has declared that. Well, can we get that in our heads? Is that hard to get a hold of? I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. If you get old enough, you will learn to accept that. I keep wondering if the people at Grace and Truth really can get a hold of that. That's hard to get a hold of, isn't it? You don't want to accept what's going on. You want to get sharp with people and put people down. You know that God made them that way so they could irritate you. He made them that way. Everybody you want to complain about, God made them like that. What I do about it, you don't do nothing. You get away from them. If they're getting on your last nerve, get away from them. But don't sit there and try to stop them from being what they are. Oh, yeah? <laughs> and how far that is, does that get you? It don't get you anywhere. But I didn't learn that till I got in my 60s. When I say I didn't learn that, I didn't mean I didn't know that. It didn't become a part of my life till I was older. When something happens, I just say, that's the will of God. Somebody come to me and say, my father died, or my, uh, my sister died. And I say, well, you know, that's the will of God. Every time I'll say that. And they'll say, yeah, <laughs> it is. It doesn't matter what, I, I don't know how I can paint this thing. If you have a car wreck, if you get sick, if you have a heart attack, if you have any kind of disease, it's the will of God. And he's teaching us to learn to accept him and his it's will. It's not all bad things. He gives us good things, too. I didn't say all bad things. That's all you're mentioning. I mentioned all bad things because people think that's not given by God. Whatever you have, sometimes the things you think are good are not good for you. I mentioned the bad things because people think, well, the bad things are not the will of God. They absolutely are. If he works all things after the counts of his own will, that means all things. That's right. And, but people don't think God has a switch. And it's hard sometimes to tell what is the switch, what's good and what's bad. Just because it's a new car, it don't mean it's good. Just because it's a, a new outfit that you got don't mean that's good. Everything, and we know that all things work together for our good. To them that are the called according to his purpose. I want to dwell on the bad things because I don't think people really believe that here. Do you have a hard time getting hold of that? I'm learning. Huh? I'm learning. Are you? <laughs> Maybe God will have to take you through a whole lot more fire. Now, most of these reformers will say, well, God works everything good. He works all things together for good he works good for good no no he works bad for good the things I've heard y'all heard me say this I went through some times in my life in the late 60s and early 70s I didn't think I could get through and they made me who I am today they actually formed me into the thinking I have and I didn't think I could live through it 
I thought, I'm going to die. And I didn't. And I came out stronger to be who I am. You won't believe something is for your good until you get way down the road there. The Bible says, I've quoted a thousand times, I know, I know that whatsoever God doeth, Ecclesiastes 3.14, whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. And what does he do? The script, well, I'm going to. He known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Forever is the word olam. If he's doing all things, Olam means it always has been, it always will be. I cannot fathom, I can't fathom how all these things have been in the mind of God from forever to forever. I can't figure that. I just... You can't add to it, you can't take away. That's right, it says you, you can't add anything to the... Not by worrying, and you can't take anything away from it. That's what the Scripture says. You can't do anything to it. You just take it. Now, I've got a lot of verses on all these things. I'm going to give you, when he said, for whom he did foreknow. For is an extremely important word. For and whom, without those two words, you can't have the rest of the verse. Because for is what you call a subordinate conjunction. A conjunction is a word that, that connects, a conjunction. You've got coordinating conjunctions, Coordinating means it connects two thoughts together. together. Jim, ran down the street and, that's a coordinating conjunction, caught the bus. and coordinates this thought and this thought. And you've got conjunctions, subordinate. Subordinate means, it means to obey. If you have a boss at work, you're their subordinate, and you have to obey what they say. This word for is a subordinating conjunction, and it, coord it, it, it has to obey what has just been said with what's about to be said. That's what it does. It's going to help you understand what's going to be said. Well, what was said before this that for is so important? Gosh. Takes you all the way back to the seventh chapter, that inner and the outer man. The outer man that serves the, the flesh and when you work your way through that eighth chapter, everything it's talking about <coughs> is how that God has to subdue that outer man that you find at the very end of chapter 7, Romans 7. And you've got a wrestling match going on with the inner man, which is Christ in you, and the outer man, the outer man, which is the flesh, which serves the law of self, and the inner man, which is Christ. And the inner man puts you through fire and trials and persecution, and that's necessary. He'll break your leg, make you lose your job, make your children sick. He'll do whatever he has to do, and that's good. In order to get our attention, Boy, God has worn me out. God put me through 30 or 40 years of 
living hell on earth. I didn't think I'd get through it. I've had all kinds of ailments and sicknesses and heart attacks and cancer and had operations I can't even remember. So it's the inner man telling the outer man, you're going to die. And it teaches us over years to die. So that coordinating, that subordinate conjunction, the subordinate conjunction is talking about the groaning in the previous verses. For whom he did foreknow. For means I'm going to connect all the things I've been talking about about getting over that, uh, that fleshly man that you find in... I've preached on this, but I don't think I've ever really exhausted it. When he says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall me deliver me from the body of this death? In verse 35 of the previous chapter, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Those are the two men that Paul talks about constantly through all of his writings. And then he starts saying in chapter 8, I keep saying, Chapter and verse is not in the Bible. Chapter 8, verse 1. That's not in there. That's not in there. This is one long letter. It's a scroll. Everything is connected. Every chapter is connected to the previous chapter. So don't just read Romans 8 and 29. For whom he did, for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that's not isolated by itself. It has to go with what has said before it. So he's talking about all through here. When he says in verse 7, or verse 5, 6, and 7, for they that are after the flesh, which is that outer man, do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the Spirit. So he's talking about the inner and the outer man, isn't he? Isn't that what he's talking about? Yeah. For to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be following the inner man is life and a peaceful life for you. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. That's talking about that last verse of the previous chapter, isn't it? For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh, with the flesh I serve the law of sin. You always got to go back to the previous chapter, verse 25. And you are, he said, so then, they that are in the flesh, the outer man cannot please God. And you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You don't, you don't get the Holy Spirit as a second work of grace like the Pentecostals say. You have to have the Spirit. That is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the new birth. Then he says, and if Christ be in you, gosh, flip back to the previous chapter with the, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. That's the Spirit. So you can back up to those chapter, that verse all through this ninth chapter. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And he goes on down here. If you live after the flesh, that outer man, there's no need to even study predestination without looking at chapter 7. You shall die if you, if you through the Spirit do mortify, kill off, necro, N-E-K-R-O-O. -O. <clears throat> if you mortify the deeds of the body, you'll live. The inner man says, I want that outer man to die. And over enough time with enough spankings and enough 
fiery trials, which is to try you, think it not strange, conidzo. Don't think that's an occasional guest. That fiery trial in 1 Peter 4 and 12 is about this predestination. God's going to get rid of you. At 80 years old, he has really got rid of most of me. Boy, I don't any want to marry more want to argue with anybody than I want to jump off this building on my head. I just don't want to do that. And I've never heard anybody preach Romans 8, 29, for whom he did for no, in connection with the chapter here that it's in. Can, can you see that? It's about this. Are you going to live in the flesh? Are you going to live after the inner man and spiritual things? Yeah, but I can't let people take advantage of me and they'll run right over me. Oh, you're living in the flesh when you say that. Can y'all see that? That's exactly what we do. And I've been as guilty as all of you. I've lived in the flesh. I ain't going to let them run over me. I told my little brother, you need to repent of your sin, Dean. He said, I'm not going to repent to you. Oh, he was absolutely not repenting. What he was saying is, I'm not going to change and believe the things you believe. Look at verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The Spirit's the inner man. But what is the Spirit? The truth. John 14, 15, 16, John 15, 26, John 16, 13, 1 John 5 and 6. The Spirit is the truth. So if the Spirit's the truth and you're led by the Spirit, you're a son of God. You're exhibiting sons of Satan's character when you want to have your way and you want to fight and you want to argue. Do I expect you to get a hold of this just because I'm saying it? No. <laughs> it's going to take a lot of fire. <laughs> you want to beat people in the head. That's not the way to... Have you ever, have you ever noticed that you don't accomplish anything being angry. Have you ever noticed that? Well, Just, you do accomplish one thing. You make yourself crazy. You make yourself crazy and sick. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not the way to live, not for the believer. And then he says, the, he goes on down here and he starts talking about, for the creature in verse 20, for the creature was made subject to vanity. Not willingly, Adam was made of corrupt dust back here, and he was made subject to vanity because God picked him up and made him out of corruption, and he couldn't keep from sinning, and it wasn't his will to do that. It was God's will, wasn't it? God made Adam willing to sin because he put him in a corrupt body. Not willingly, but by reason of God, it says him, it means God, who hath subjected Adam the same in hope. Boy, I love that verse. For the creature was made subject to vanity, metiotes, transientness, just sin. It's made subject to sin, but it wasn't Adam's sin. He was made subject to this outer man. That's what he's made subject to because God put him in a body like that. But by reason of God who has subjected the same, and he subjected you and I in hope, those of us that are believers, the unbelievers are not creatures. They're not creations. A creation is something God does, and it's righteous. So the creature is the inner man. There was verse 2 of Genesis, it's chaos. That's what happens when sin enters a man's life. Chaos enters. Because the creature itself also be delivered from bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. 
And we know that the whole creation groaneth. Sustenazo. The whole creation, the whole church. Sustenazo. Stenazo is the verb form of straight is the gate. Straight means it's a, it's a, it's very pressuring on all sides, and people are giving you a hard time. And su means together or with. It's a form of sum. Sum is a form. It's a way of putting fellowship on the front of a word without putting the whole word on it. It's a prefix. Sum. Sustenazo is the word groan. And this is all about predestination. You have to go through the groaning, and that's what brings you to a place of conforming to Christ's likeness because he's given you a hard time for year after year after year. And you do a lot of sin and you do a lot of things you shouldn't do because you lose your temper and you just go berserk and go through the roof and say, oh, I won't have this and I'm not letting people treat me this way. And you do that till you have a heart attack or you have some kind of health attack and you nearly die and you're in the hospital. I've done that. I've been there. I worked my way into the hospital with 25 to 30 years of stress. I went knocking on the hospital door and said, let me in. It wasn't literal, but I was doing that with what I was doing, stressing, getting angry, just losing it all the time, trying to force people to do right. You ever tried to force somebody to believe the truth? <laughs> That's like trying to force a dog to become a cat or vice versa. You can't force anybody to be something they're not wanting to be. Well, you're wanting to be God. That's what you're wanting to be. Now. Hard head. Yeah. And the whole, whole creation is groaning together. When you see groan, that's a form. The noun is stenos. Straight is the gate. You have to go through the stenos, the straight gate, and that takes you into the narrow way. That's what this whole chapter is about, a straight gate that causes you to groan because groan, stenos is the noun, stenazo is the verb. So groan and straight and narrow all have to do with each other. Can you all see this? And we've all been temperamental and high strung. Well, not you, Jim. Oh, yes. Terrible. I mean, I have made a fool of myself. Has anybody ever done that? Yeah. <laughs> we need to stop that. It. I've worked with Dave a long time on this. Dave used to get mad at the whole world, didn't he? <laughs> And I say, but Dave, God made them people to go to hell and they're all vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. And if they are believers, he's got them all messed up in their head till he can take them through 40 years of, of trials till they can learn to behave and learn to bow to God's will. It, most of the world out here is messed up, aren't they? And the vessels of wrath are the majority of the world and they're crazy, they're insane. They can't think rational. So do you get mad at some guy out here at Central State because he's in, he's in the booby hatch out there and, and he's saying, I'm Napoleon. And, and you say, no, you're not. And you start arguing with him. Well, don't argue with a crazy man. I'm not going to argue the preachers up and down the street. And I think they're all crazy when they preach uh, accept Christ and sinners' prayer for salvation. they got Christmas and Easter. And they never preach that uh, Jesus said you have to be hated by the world. You're crazy if you, if I think preachers are crazy. I'm not going to talk to them. If I do, I'm going to rebuke them. I rebuke two real big preachers in town here publicly. Now, let's keep reading down through here. 
he's talking about we ourselves grown there in verse 23. But ourselves also, which have first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. Every time you find the word adoption, that shows you that you don't have nothing to do with getting into heaven and getting into the kingdom of God. Adoption is into a family. Adoption is the word huiothosia. I don't believe God looks ahead and sees who will believe him because there's none good, none righteous, and nobody in the flesh seeks God while they're dead in sin. No one. So how can, and most of the reformers say, well, God will look ahead and see who would accept him. That's free will. So he predestinates them. So most, a lot of those people that believe that, believe it's according to the will of man that he comes in. Only when God sees his will uh, ready to believe God will God predestinate him. That's not predestination. That's free will. The Bible says in Psalms 110.3, great verse, thy people. Thy is a possessive pronoun. Thy, possessive. It means God owned them. Possessive pronoun. A pronoun, by the way, takes the place of a noun. That's why it's called a pronoun. It's for the noun. It's in place of a noun. Thy people, if he could name all of us, he would put Jim and Dave and Charday and Mary and so forth, on and on and on, and Brittany and Glenn and... The rest of them. He'd put us all down, but it's we are his people. He says, Thy people, God owns them, shall be willing in the day of thy power. It means they're not willing until God makes them willing. Thy power. So God's people, he owns them. It's the same thing in John 10, the parable of the good shepherd. Jesus said, I'm the door of the sheep. If any man enters in, he has to come by me. And the Pharisees came to Jesus and they said, how long are you going to make us to doubt? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. He said, I told you. Over there in John 8, 47, I told you, if you're of God, you'll believe me, but if you're not of God, you won't believe me, and you're not of mine, get away from me. That's what he told the Pharisees in essence. He says, my sheep. He didn't say goats become sheep. He didn't say that. He said, they're mine. My is another possessive pronoun. Possessive pronoun, singular. My sheep, they belong to me. They hear my voice. They know me. And I want you to notice what he says here. I've said it. And I think I've always said it too fast. He said, they're my sheep. And before they come to the knowledge of me, I give them. I give to my sheep that I own. I give them eternal life. And Jesus told the Pharisees in that same context, you will not believe because you're not of my 
sheep. I keep saying this. If God's people will hear, why are you arguing with people? Never argue with people. Give them the truth. If they don't want it, they'll tell you. If they don't want it, you'll see it in their eyes when they go. They look off in space. Have you ever talked to somebody look off in space? I've done that. And I just walk away. The sheep will hear. You can't argue goats into hearing. They don't have ears to hear. And he says, my sheep hear my voice. Y'all understand what I'm saying? I give my sheep. They're, they're my sheep before I give them eternal life. They're mine, and I convert them and put light in their heart. I birth them with a new birth because they're mine and they were given to me by the Father from the foundation of the world. And Jesus said, All that the Father giveth me, John 6, 37, shall come to me, not might come. So you don't have to. I'll tell you what, we're more free than free will people are because they always got to convince people, find some guy in the street, twist his arm behind his back and say, Repeat this prayer after me and you'll get to go to heaven by this sinner's prayer. We're more free than they are because we can say, look, God's got his sheep chosen. If you're one of them, you'll hear. And if you're not, you won't. They have to do a ritual. Uh, they have to do a ritual. And they think a ritual is going to save them. Yeah. Ritual is not going to save anybody. I've said this, and I don't know if y'all really have gotten a hold of it. It took me a long time to get a hold of this. You don't have anything to do with going to heaven. Nothing. Not anything. God simply picked you out if you are his elect. Came along one day in some kind of situation and put truth in your heart when it's sitting there with the outer man. The outer man likes to argue with it and wants to fight back at it. But God put it there, and he's not going to let anything take it away from you. And over time, he'll have that inner man go through fire and trials and persecution, tribulation, till you start giving up self. And that happened to me. It's not a decision you make. It has never been a decision that anybody makes. Just all of a sudden, you wake up one day, and you find yourself interested in the Bible. You go, why am I interested? I don't remember having any kind of experience. The new birth comes only by the miracle of God. Only he knows how he does that in each one of us. I can't understand Jim, it. let me ask you a question. Do you think when we, we come to the knowledge of all this that it's so... Like yeah, it's it's not. It they doesn't happen. Like they it do. don't happen all at once, like these people say. I walked down the aisle. I got saved one night. No, you didn't. I, I don't. I was expecting to feel something when I got dipped and all that. It's not something you feel. It's something that comes on you. It's this inner man being driven out by that the outer man driving out the inner man or the inner man driving out the outer man. It's all, most of what you do when Christ comes in you, most of your life is like this. Christ is there, and you know that's there. You've got a whole lot of self, self, self. And over the years, God has to send trials, persecution, and a little at a time, self is driven out. This is called increasing faith. Paul said, besides all this, give all diligence, add to your faith. And this, this, is, this is those additions to faith, virtue, and knowledge, and temperance, and so forth. There in Second Peter. And the faith grows, and self starts disappearing and when you get to be old you'll be like Milton was and you'll have just a thin veneer of self but it'll be most of it will be Christ in you 
the older you get and the longer you live. But what will, this is like leaven. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like leaven. You put a little bit of leaven in a, a big lump of dough, and before long, the whole dough is leavened. And it takes over us just like this. But the thing is, we've got truth that we live in. How much time do I have, Mike? 17. All right, look here. Let's get back over here to Romans 9. I didn't mean to go here. You never did dwell on Matthew Henry. Well, he, Matthew Henry and the rest of these guys say, well, God looked ahead in time and saw who would uh, accept him, and then they then he predestined them after he realized who would believe him. It's not true. You're not any different than Adolf Hitler or Attila the Hun or Jeffrey Dahmer when you're in the flesh and you have no truth in you. You're, all sinners are the same except for the grace of God. You will do those same things. People don't believe they're that bad. That's why... I'm like I preach that message once in a while. People don't believe in predestination because they don't know how evil they are. They don't know how evil they are. What? I got a Matthew Henry Bible. Well, no, you, then nobody can hear it from up here. But I don't want to get on Matthew Henry. I don't agree with a lot of things he, he said. On both ends of the I know that he was always. He said that uh, God looked ahead in time and saw who would believe in him, and then he predestined him. That's not true. God's, God's grace is not contingent on what you will do down the line because you won't do anything because you will not seek God. Nobody seeks God, period. Where do these guys come? Where do these reformers come up with that? And they don't like the idea that God sends men to hell on purpose. I got a track over here. This God sends men to hell on purpose. He says that God, He creates sin and then he hates it. It doesn't appear that he hates it. He hates it. And he says, um, God endured them with much long suffering, exercised a great deal of patience towards them, and so they became fitted for destruction, fitted by their own sin and self-hardening. Not self-hardening. Most of them say that they harden themselves. The thing is, God made them out of corruption and they couldn't do nothing but sin. There's not really any difference than a, in a corporate head and some murderer on death row out here at the prison. No difference. Do you think there's a good hell and a bad hell? And the, and the corporate head that goes to a church, when he dies, he goes to the good hell, and below that is the bad hell for some ax murderer? No. God hates the double dealing that the corporate head does as bad as he hates the killing. God hated false teachers in the Old Testament worse than somebody killing. David was a murderer, and he loved David. And David was an adulterer, and David wept and cried and repented. Unless God deals with a man's heart, he can't come. No man can come to me, Jesus said. He said this, John 6, 44. No man can come to me except my Father which has sent me draw him. And that's not a magnetic pull. That word draw, helco, means to drag in. Helco. Look, look at that real quick because I want to show you something here. Look at John 6. John 6. And he says here in John 6, 44, No man can come to me except my Father which has sent me. Draw him, in verse 44, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's Helco, drag in. And over in John, the 21st chapter, 
Peter's out fishing and they cast the net on the right side of the ship and they cast therefore and now they were not able to draw in the fish for the multitude. That word draws the word helco. In John 21 and verse 6. It's the same word. It's an effort. It's dragging us in. And people say, God won't make you do something that you don't want to do. He certainly will. What he will do, he will change your rebellious will to his righteous will. How he does that, only he knows. And Who get back. Your thinking? Huh? Who controls your thinking? That's what he said in Proverbs 16 and 1. This, in, in order to do this, you have to be controlling a man's thinking. The preparations of the heart in man and the answer to the tongue is from the Lord. Yeah. Everything that you say whew, comes from God. And look back over here at verse 26 in Romans 8. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. The Spirit, the inner man, helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Remember, prayer means to bow to the will of God. But the Spirit itself, the inner man, maketh intercession for us with groanings, stenagmas, a form of stenazo, another form of the straight and narrow way which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession in Tuncano. He impinges our progress. This whole chapter is how hard God's making it on us. And then he says he makes intercession. It means to stop the path we're on and make us go another way when it's getting too hard for us. For the saints, according to the will of God, and we know that all things that you've been going through that's calling all this groaning is working together for your good because you love God and you are the call, the ecclesia of the church, according to his purpose, for. For points back to everything that's been said. And it's a whom. Every one of these verses is talking about a whom. It's talking about that inner man from the last verse of the previous chapter and the outer man that serves the law of the flesh and how the inner man is going to drive that outer man into death. If you live long enough and you're a believer, you'll get over yourself. And I hadn't heard a preacher even preach this. For we know for whom he did foreknow, not what he foreknew. Whom is referring to the inner man, all previous chapter here. That's whom. It's masculine, gender, singular. It's not talking about the people that God knew would accept him. Nobody will accept him. You're dead in sin. You can't do nothing as a dead man, can you? Nothing. For whom he did foreknow, it's a people he foreknew. Prognosco. Since whom is masculine, gender, singular, he's got a whole bunch of whoms. And the whoms is the church. It's the called out from the previous verse. It's the called. It's them that love God from the previous verse. It's the church, it's the wife, it's the bride of Christ. That's the whom's. It's not what God knew would they would make a decision. It was not based on their decisions. Why is it Paul didn't make a decision for the Lord? Jesus just struck him down and said, Paul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who art thou, Lord? That's a funny verse. Yeah. Who art thou, Jim? Who art thou, John? Who art thou, Glenn? Paul knew who he was. 
the homes is what he knew. When the Bible says in Matthew 7, this word here is prognosco, for no. It means to know, to know intimately. Since it's a whom, that's a people, that's a person. No is the word whom he did foreknow, prognosco. I wrote it up here. It comes from no pro, meaning before. And gnosko means to know the whom's beforehand. To know before, for whom he did foreknow. I mean, it's crazy what they do to this. It was the people he foreknew. It was the church, his wife, his bride, the called, those that love God in the previous verse. That's the ones, and he said over in Matthew 7, he said, many are going to come in that day at the judgment. Say, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in thy name? And thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. He's going to say, Depart from ye that work iniquity. I never gnosko you. I never knew you. You're a vessel of wrath, fitted to destruction, made to be taken and destroyed. But those that I foreknew, I knew before the foundation of the world, in the mind of God. That's what he's saying. And if he knew you, he knew you to conform you to his likeness. The ones he foreknew, he didn't just foreknow you to go to heaven. He foreknew and he predestined prohorizo. He pro before horizo. That's our word horizon. He predetermined you for the light. The horizon and the horizon is the division of day and night are light and darkness. And forgiveness means to pardon and release from prison. And that's darkness because prison, fulake, means division of day and night are light and darkness. Light, dark. So to pardon and release from prison Aphesis means to, that's the word forgiveness. It means to pardon from darkness and lead to the light. So you're predestined to be forgiven, but not without repentance. So God has to rebuke you in your heart, and forgiveness comes as you repent daily from your old self and that old man has to die off I am so thankful to be 80 I can't stand the Jim Brown at 35 he drove me out of my mind me too. Yeah, and you too I mean I really did I was a basket case most of the time in my 30s I was mad at the world I didn't understand I wasn't supposed to be mad at the world this is all the will of God you think most of us were? Yeah. Most of the believers kind of get crazy when they're young, don't they? Until you get out of it. <laughs> I just, this, this thing bothers me with the reformers. They think God just, they don't really believe predestination. When somebody says, you believe predestination, I say, not like you think. I believe everything, the good, the evil, the bad. But he doesn't do that so you can say, well, I'll just, since the, evil's, since the evil is ordained by God, I think I'll go out and just have fun. Oh, you do that, he'll beat your brains out, if you're a believer. He'll beat you with a ball that's about 500 miles long. He's, he says in here, sinners fit themselves for hell. No. I mean, it's... Don't. God fits them for destruction. That's the thing most reformers say. Really? 
Sinners fit themselves, yeah. The sin will fit them for hell, but God put them in those sinful bodies and unredeemed. They don't want to blame God for hell or for sin, and God is the one that invented it. Listen to this. He says, God chooses some and refuses others <clears throat> by his own absolute and sovereign will. Well, he does that. But then he turns around and... They want to, they're trying to absolve God of blame. And they think if you create sin and create evil, that makes God to blame. No, that makes God God. When he says, thou shalt not kill, he wasn't talking about himself. He said, I kill, I make alive, I wound, I heal. But it's not murder when I kill. I kill because I want to. And God is not under the law. He can create sin and it's not sin. He can do what he wants to for some reason, we think God is on our level. And he's not. He's above the law. Well, I'm out of time. Maybe I explained some things there. I hope I did. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Deal with our hearts. Fight our battles because we can't fight them anymore. We're not able to. Thank you for truth. Lord, keep this ministry going. Open up many doors for us to go through. I don't know how to do things. I just get up here and preach. And, and if you want a building to come about, you'll have to do it. I can't do that. I'm not some hustler that wants to hustle people. Deal with our lives, Lord, and lead us in your way. Lead us to your elect. In Christ's name, amen. Well, I don't agree with most of those uh, reformers. Well, he contradicts himself. I know that, but the, all of them do. They all do that, Mary. They were all that way. Hey, Rusty. What do you know? So isn't, uh, isn't like hell code the exact opposite of free will? I think so. <laughs> You're dragged in there. You're being dragged in. You're being dragged in. I ain't free will, I ain't got nothing to do with it. Yeah. But it's a free will choice. Yeah, it's stupid, isn't it? It's dumb. Hey, bro. Hey. What's going on? Helco. <laughs> yeah, Helco. Helco, Helco is going on. Yep. Being drug. <laughs> I love predestination. I have to preach over it once in a while, but that's, I love that. that bothers me that these reformers talk about believing predestination and they... Charday, yes. was I preaching to you? He's preaching to me. Yeah. <laughs> All of us, man. All of us. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll make up for that. I'll hug you. <laughs> I need it. More fire. He was like, give me fire. I was like, don't tell God that. <laughs> so more fire. She need it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> How you doing? I'm good. This was amazing. This, yeah. All that stuff I went through at the beginning with the reformers and everything and then but they weren't deep enough they didn't get it. Oh they don't they don't really believe predestination. Hey my brother Dave. I love you guys. I love you too. I really do. <laughs> We're learning ask us all the time what do we believe? Huh? People ask us all ask me all the time. And it's hard to tell them without them listening. Yeah you almost have to give them a lot of detail believe in the Bible. Just just kill yeah, us Sheldon, how you doing? Right. Sheldon. That's good, isn't it? Yeah, that's her favorite. That's good, isn't it? Especially with those eyes. Looking right out at you. Looks like he's going to get you, doesn't he? Yeah, that's good. She's good, isn't she? Huh? Do you draw? I used to. Did you? Can you draw like that? No. That wolf's going to get somebody, isn't he? She's got them wrinkles up on his snarling nose just right.
she drawing all that this past few days. That's neat there. She don't, she don't gotta look at anything. She can just draw. Oh, she has to look at stuff. Yeah. She's catching. Glenn, what you been doing? Did you used to listen to these reformers? No. Did you read that? I, I never heard none of that until I got here. Really? Never knew what well, they, they have a watered-down form of it. It's watered down. I was all Baptist and charismatic and all that. Yeah. Well, the reformers claim to believe like us, but they don't because it's kind of watery predestination, you know. And I don't like that. Atoll. I want the real thing, you know. See you, Dave. Okay, I love you. Bye, Brittany. <laughs>